Ron, okay. may I ask you to send sure. your slides to me just by email? Sure. Because some people okay. in my laboratory are interested in that stuff. So I will okay. uh, let them okay. know. For sure. Peter, so Peter, do we start at recording? Peter, make him a co-host. It'll work better. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Yes. Okay, the important thing is you can see my slides, right? Yeah. Yeah. I get, yeah. Okay. Everything else is noise. You can see my slides, that's it. Okay. Shall we start? Okay. Yes, first uh, I'll give uh, to Volgang to say a few words. Ah, this. Yeah, to you present the, the lecturer. See? Yeah, this is he the is giving, part. Ron, Listen, listen, listen. He is giving me the distinct privilege to turn to the biggest mistake <laughs> this university has ever done in letting someone go. I see. Okay? So it's, it's my- I thought you were gonna say hiring me, but- <laughs> <laughs> That's next time. <laughs> Anyway, we have this game going on. He has nice introductions for me too. All right, so uh, it's a great pleasure to have Ron speaking today on the colloquium, which at the same time is the beginning of our spring school, which we, which we are doing now the first time in a virtual manner. Probably is even better in terms of dissemination. So well, most people here know Ron extremely well. Maybe the very young ones don't so much. Uh, I was thinking of what are a few words that characterize him best. Okay, infinitely many visits to other institutions, ICM plenary talk, three honorary degrees, AMS IM fellow, Alexander von Humboldt fellow, Academy of Sciences in both US Academy of Sciences and those of Arts and Sciences. So it's definitely our great privilege to have him giving this talk. And um, I think this will be very exciting. And it will be right on spot of the theme of this spring school. Okay, Ron. Okay, thank you, Wolfgang, for not saying anything bad about me. Next time. Oh, next you have to bite time. your tongue. Then. Next time. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was good. The blood uh, is dripping. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, deep learning and neural nets. I imagine most of you are. <clears throat> So why is my slides not advancing? Oh, well, it advances it that way. Okay, I'm sure most of you have heard a lot of the uh, press about uh, deep learning and its successes, for example, in face and digit recognition and playing games in the Google driverless car and so on. Uh, one gets the impression that if you have a learning problem, you just drop it into this black box and out will come a, a very successful algorithm that you can employ. Uh, but I wanna point out some caveats before I begin. One is uh, this adversarial uh, situation, which maybe you're aware of. This is an emerging subject in learning called adversarial learning. And uh, here is an example that will make you stand back a little bit and reassess what's going on. So here the problem was uh, the learning algorithm was given data in the form of images and was asked to classify the data. That means that they look into the image and decide whether perhaps a cat is in the image, a dog, a, a pig, a, car or whatever. So these are called uh, classification uh, algorithms where you classify what the content of the image is. And the data is trained usually by humans who look at the image and say, yes, this image contains a pig. Yes, this image contains a dog and so on. And that data is given over to the learning algorithm and or to, to the this black box who creates a learning algorithm, which is supposed to perform on any new image 
and tell you what the content of the new image is. And so in this adversarial example, this left image here was uh, given as data and said, hey, this is a pig. You know, it was told, it was labeled as a pig. Then you add a very small amount of noise to the data. There it is. And you get a new image, which nobody could distinguish from the original image. And yet the classification algorithm doesn't classify this as a pig, but classifies this as an airplane. So this is the problem, right? I mean, we all have to agree. In, in our jargon, we would say these neural nets are very unstable. Little perturbation blows up the, the whole thing very, very quickly. From a mathematical point of view, in my point of view, the problem is that we do not have a good understanding of what these deep learning algorithms are doing. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know when to use them. We, we don't know how they perform. In particular, there are no performance guarantees. What you would like normally, if you have an algorithm, is you could certify the performance of the algorithm to tell that with certain probability or certain certainty, it's going to do the job correctly. So I want to understand why we're in this situation and how do we get out of it or what the future holds. OK, so what is this the core problem in uh, learning. We have a function that's unknown to us. I call it little f. It's defined on some domain and takes real values. Now you can make it take vector values. That's not a problem. I just make my life easier by assuming it's real values. The domain here typically is a domain in Euclidean space. In deep learning, this Euclidean space, Rn, is actually, n is very, very large, number of pixels in, a, in an image. So n is maybe 10,000 or something. That's going to be an issue. The job we have, the core problem is, OK, we're given some data about this function, f. And what we'd like to do is to create from this data. So we get to see f somewhere something about f, we don't know f completely. And what we would like to do is create a surrogate or an approximation, I'll call it f hat, to f. So that if somebody came along and gave us a new data point or a new query, well, we could tell uh, pretty accurately, hopefully very accurately, what f was at that point, okay? Or at that data observation. I mean, if you want to keep a simple example in mind uh, during this talk as uh, intuition, think of the following problem. I have a function defined on the interval 0, 1. I give you the value of this function at some points. M is always going to be the number of data points. And we want to be able to say what F looks like away from those data points at points X not equal to one of the XIs. OK, I'm going to talk about this uh, problem may, almost exclusively in the deterministic setting. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with the stochastic setting. What I say has a conversion to the stochastic setting, but because of time and uh, my interest, I'm not uh, going to uh, enter into that discussion. So uh, let's first see how a functional analyst would look at this or an analyst. The first thing, if somebody came into your office and gave you this, uh, say, said they had this uh, function f, uh, they didn't know what it was, but they had this data and they asked you to create an approximation to f, uh, what would you do? I mean, the first thing you would say, well, look, uh, from the information you gave me, I can't tell you anything because F could be anything off of the data, right? By the way, when I say something like right, you can chime in and say no or, or, or argue with me. All right, so 
you need some extra information about F if you that that will guide you how to proceed, and also if you want to certify that the 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 approximation you come up with has some performance guarantees, you need to know something about F. We call that additional information, model class information. And so we summarize this by saying that F is in some set K, where K is a compact set typically, and we call this a model class. For example, we, you may say that, well, I know the function has one derivative. Okay, that would be model class information. The second thing you would say to him is, uh, look, or her, look, uh, tell me when I'm done creating this F hat, how are you gonna measure success of my algorithm? How are you gonna check and say, oh yeah, you did a good job. No, you didn't do a good job. Well, that we need to know. And usually, we do this by measuring the error between the true F and what we created from the data, this F hat, in some norm, right? That's the error, and that's how we measure the quality of, of our uh, approximation F hat. <clears throat> in this talk, I'm gonna take the norm to be a Hilbert space norm only because, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it, the geometry, Geometry is simpler and I can explain everything a lot easier in the Hilbert space setting than a general Banach space setting. But I tell you in advance that whatever I do has some analog in, in a Banach space setting you can find in a paper by these authors. Okay, so what is the information we're given? I'm, I'm in this Hilbert space setting and I, I, I want to say the information is given to me as linear functionals applied to f. Maybe the integral of f times some uh, uh, function or uh, could be point values, but then I would need that the Hilbert space is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. But to, to the information I'm going to say that I, got, I have about f are m evaluations of f through linear functionals. Okay, so what I really know about F, the totality of information I know about F is what? I know that it's in this model class K and I know it's data in terms of these linear functionals applied to F, all right? And the set of all functions KW that lie in K and satisfy the data, this is what I know about F. No more, no less, right? F could be any function in the set KW. Any questions so far? You understand the, the setting? This is, this is our problem. Okay. The guys that know it say it's trivial. The guys that don't know it, I say, well, nah, I don't know. <coughs> okay. We want to approximate F by some uh, F hat. Actually, I'm going to give a graphic here that will explain this slide. So the blue here set is really kw blue is kw this is all so i'm in a hilbert space and this is some set in the hilbert space this is all functions i know in the hilbert space to satisfy the data this blue set if i'm asked to approximate f and all i know is f is in this blue region the best i can do is to take the center of the smallest ball that contains k and that's called the Chebyshev center of this set K, KW. And the radius of this ball would be the best error I could give for the approximation. So that's what this previous slide was saying that this problem, given this way, has a simple geometric explanation and solution as to the optimal performance you can do at recovering F from the data. This is called optimal recovery. Well, it sounds simple, so yeah, except that it's almost impossible to find this Chebyshev ball and find the center of this ball. It's a miracle if you can do it in a given setting, not a miracle, but at least it's a difficult problem. But that's our goal. 
That's the best we could do. And our goal numerically would be to try to do as well or close to as well as finding the Chebyshev Center. For example, if we could find a numerical algorithm that performed with an error that's just a constant times its radius, right? Let's say three times the radius. We would all be happy. We would go home and have a, a glass of cognac or in Peter's case, uh, he would have uh, rakia and, and we would be consider the problem to be done. Notice that if I found any guy here in, in uh, this blue region, any guy, I don't need to find a center, any other point in the region, that would already be satisfactory because the distance, the, the, the performance of using that guy as the approximation is within a factor two of being the best performer. And I would be happy, okay? Everybody with me? Hopefully. All right. So let's see, you know, I want to put this in, in a little bit more of a functional analytical uh, setting. So we're in a, this Hilbert space. So we know that these linear functionals, LJ, right? These, this is where we got our data from. You could think of them as point evaluation, but you know, in a Hilbert space, in L2, for example, you can't take point values uh, because only the find almost everywhere, et cetera. But we have these linear functionals. Every linear functional in a Hilbert space can be represented as an inner product with an element, which I call omega j, from the Hilbert space. This is called the Reese representation theorem, which you learn in your first course in functional analysis. I, I can assume that these omega j's are, are known to me. For example, if you had a measuring device, you would somehow know what the omega j was, you're integrating over something. So I consider the omega j's known to me. And I look at the space W, which is spanned by the omega j's. Remember there are M measurements. And this space here is a subspace of the Hilbert space of dimension M. And what I really know about F is from the data is the projection of F onto the space W. You can very easily, you know, use Gram Schmidt or whatever and convert and, and find a projection of F onto this space W. So in essence, this is what the information is telling me. The data is telling me what this, this is. What we don't know is what does F look like in the direction orthogonal to W, right? In that direction, we don't know what F looks like. What we do know is that F is in K. That's our information. I mean, that's our model class, right? Assumption that F is in K. So that puts a constraint on how big or what P W perp F could be. And so what we really want to understand is how could we extract this component of F and how, you know, what are the possible components that you could get here given that F is in K and given that you have the given measurements. So every element in KW is of the form, you know, I let little w denote the projection of F onto the space capital W. And every element in KW is just little w plus something from the uh, w perp, which is the null space, right, of the measurements. That is, it can be written w plus eta. And if you measured eta through these LJs, you would get zero for the measurements. OK, so this gives you, I hope, some geometrical feeling for what's going on here. I think I have a graphic. Here's a graphic to explain what's going on, uh, if you didn't follow it. So the blue, the blue blob here is K, OK? That's my set K in this big Hilbert space. W is this subspace where, which contains the information I have about F. So what I know is that I have a guy in this blue space and I know his projection 
onto W. Its projection onto W is, is going to be a point on the pink uh, plane here, right? And all the guys that share the same information from K will mean that you can move in the perpendicular direction to W, which in this case, because I'm three-dimensional, is a line segment. In general, this is a hyperplane, but this, in this case, is the line segment. And so what I know about F is that it lies on this line segment where I entered uh, K at the bottom and I exited K at the top. So that's what I would know about F. This is the set KW and I would know F was on this line segment. So that's the geometrical uh, description of the problem. Now let's talk about how, how one numerically could possibly handle this problem. Well, I think you're all very familiar with least squares. In fact, if somebody came into your office and gave you some data and asked you to uh, find an approximation, you probably would think of employing least squares in some sense, right? I mean, it's the thing we all learn in, in undergraduate school, uh, least squares. So what does least squares do? It says, well, I'm going to pick some uh, set sigma, it's usually a linear space of functions that I'm going to use to try to fit the data with this. Maybe I'll use polynomials to fit the data. Maybe I'll use splines to fit the data. Maybe I'll use trigonometric polynomials to fit the data. But I, I take some set sigma. And typically, sigma is a linear space, a finite dimension. And the dimension is usually less than the number of data points, right? And then you look for an S in this linear space, such that the measurements of S match those that you were given. So you try to minimize this difference. Now, if M were equal to N, or N were equal to M, you took the space so big that N was equal to M, then you would be able to fit this exactly, right? And that would give you your F hat. In general, so this is how we get our F hat, or I denoted by a star here, through least squares. Now, normally in the, in, in the world uh, we lived in uh, 10 years ago, we would uh, take N less than M. Why? Well, this has statistical reason that you usually thought that the, the, the measurements had noise in them and you didn't want to interpolate noise. And so you, you use N less than M and then you can prove some theorems that even if you have noise, you're doing a reasonable job. Okay, in the world of deep learning, we'll see that they actually take N much, much bigger than M. So you have M as a number of data points, but and they don't use a linear space, we'll get into that, but they have a nonlinear space of quote dimension n, where n is much, much bigger than m. This is called over-parameterized learning. Now the problem will be that there'll be many solutions to this problem in that case. You're over-parameterized, so you don't have a unique solution to this least squares problem. And that'll be uh, something we'll have to work around. Oh, okay. Uh, one question you could ask is how should you choose sigma? Oh, that's a good question. By the way, it's, all, it's, sort of, it's an open question. We don't know how to have to choose sigma. Now, what typically people do is they say, well, let, let me look at my model class. I have this model class and I'll take sigma as a space that's good at approximating functions in the model class. For example, if, if my model class is functions with one derivative bounded, then I might say, well, I'll use polynomials because I know they approximate these functions well. So I'll use polynomials of degree n to do the approximation. Or so you use the model class to decide on this, but you really shouldn't just use the model class to make your decision because W, the measurements play an important role. 
it's, it's sort of a meshing between the data information and the model class. And so really you should say, well, I, re I know the model class, but I also know the data sites. I know these linear functionals and I should combine the two to pick the best sigma. We don't know how to do this, really. I mean, theoretically we can describe something, but practically, numerically, we don't know how to do this. But we, we proceed on. So here's one thing that always, uh, I mean, maybe it didn't bother me at the time, but now it bothers me, is that if you look in the usual treatments of least squares, you'll never see an error estimate for least squares. They'll tell you what to do and say, oh, here's least squares. But if you say, how does least squares perform? Unless you put yourself in a stochastic setting where you have random measurements, et cetera, et cetera, noise and you know, embellish the problem, you'll see no direct estimate how these squares perform. But there is, uh, in fact, the best estimate for how these squares performs. And it's given in this paper with uh, six people here, many of whom have uh, a, all but two have a, uh, South Carolina connection, right? Peter and Wolfgang and are there. I was there. Gergana was a uh, graduate student at uh, South Carolina. Albert visited, of course, a hundred times. And uh, Shemek visited a few times as well. Okay, so what's the bottom line is that you can prove an estimate for how well these squares. So F hat here is the least squares fit using some sigma, uh, where sigma now I'm assuming is a linear space of dimension n, then the error is given by not quite the distance of f to sigma, which would be great because then you would just pick sigma to, to minimize this uh, distance to the model class k. But there is this disturbing factor mu sitting here. It's a number, right? And mu, here's some uh, description of what mu is. It depends on your choice sigma. So mu depends on sigma and also depends on the data or on the W, right? And uh, if you want a few words to say, what is mu? It's sort of saying, uh, how well can you see the perp direction uh, in, in uh, this space sigma? Because if the perp, direction is very small, very little energy for a guy in there, then the mu is very large. Okay, and here's the estimate, and you can't improve this estimate. That's what we, we show, that this is the best possible bound. So if you just do least squares, this is where you're, you are. This is where what the estimate you're, you're stuck with. And it may be that the data you're given is bad data, right? You could have, have bad measurements. For example, in the, the example I gave you of points in zero one, you could have all those points near zero and therefore you would never be able to predict the function near the point one. So you would have bad data. This would correspond to a mu, which is very large. Okay, bottom line, least squares does not meet our goal. Our goal was to find an algorithm that performed like the best algorithm, this Chebyshev center business. This does not do the job. Can we remedy that? Well, I'm gonna tell you that sorta. Of. If my model class, I mean, it's gonna depend on something about the model class. If this model class K, remember that's the information I have about F. If it's the unit ball of some subspace of H, unit ball Y, then I'm gonna be able to do something. Now you may say, well, wow, that looks fairly restrictive that it's a unit ball of some subspace of Y. I say, no, no, it's not too restrictive. It's really just saying that K is a convex centrally symmetric set in H. Do you all know why? Volodya, do you know why? 
why is k it's just saying k is a convex centrally symmetric because every norm it's unit ball is a convex centrally symmetric set and given any convex centrally symmetric set you can define a, a norm mm -hmm. from it and this unit ball would be k so so this assumption about k is just assuming that k is convex and centrally symmetric i'm sorry to wake you up Melodia. it's hard giving these talks where you can't interact with the audience okay if I have a, this information about the model class, I can modify my least squares problem by adding a penalty where the penalty is, I, I don't just try to minimize the, the least square of the data fit, but I also add a, a, that I want G to be in Y or, or this unit ball or close to this unit ball. So I put this penalty here. This is called penalized least squares. And if you choose, I'm thinking, can anybody tell me, uh, Peter, what's the time? 502? 502? 503, yeah. Yeah. You okay. have for half an hour. Yeah, okay. So I want to be careful about the time because I, I want to be able to get to the good stuff, right? A lot of this stuff is so trivial, you're falling asleep. If you put this penalty term here, then, uh, and if you did this minimization, not over a sigma, <coughs> but all of H, which of course is not numerically possible, we'll get to that. But if you did this, this would satisfy your goal. This you can prove if lambda is sufficiently small, this will satisfy the goal. It will give you an, uh, uh, an F hat that is close to the uh, optimal performance in this Chebyshev set. Now, the fact that we can't do this numerically because we can't take the minimization over all of H, but it still tells us a little glimpse of what to do. It says take a sigma, which is close, you know, is big enough that it mimics doing the minimization all over all of H. This sort of pushes you in the direction of doing over parameterized, right? Says, yeah, maybe that's why they do over parameterized because, you know, solving this least squares problem with penalization uh, should, should work in that case. And indeed, if you do choose a space sigma, and this can be linear or nonlinear. So far, I'm really talking about linear spaces sigma. And if I solve this problem, and if sigma is a big dimension, n is huge, yeah, real big, then I can show that it sort of meets the goal. Why, why do you say sort of? Well, unfortunately, <clears throat> there's a little caveat, but uh, if, if I solve this problem for such a sigma, here's the estimate I can prove. What I would really want here was R of KW, right? Remember R of KW was the radius of the model class KW. What I have instead is this KW prime where W prime is close to W. Now, Wolfgang, Peter, Albert, all know the reason for this is modulus, right? But nevertheless, okay, you still can drive this typically to, to uh, uh, be close to the actual best estimate. Okay, so there's the bottom line of these observations is over-parameterization does help. Go ahead, Wolfgang, you had a question. You could, you, you could well sell it. You could say these measurements are never, never correct, <clears throat> right? Uh, yeah. And it, it, so that padded, that padded slice is in a way uh, not such fact, a wrong thing. <clears throat> okay, so this will eat up a minute or two of time, but uh, look, it, you, you wonder why in, in statistical estimation, 
they incorporate noise. So they incorporate noise. I don't think their incorporation of noise is usually that realistic. They assume Gaussian noise or something like that. And they always assume rather big noise levels. That's an advantage to them because then they have a, a, a worse estimate that they have to prove. The, the, the optimal estimate is not so good. And so they have an easier task of proving that estimate. We know this, Wolfgang and I, from the Bayes guys, Bayesian inference. Uh, so I try not to incorporate noise until the very end. I, I, I like to see what's going on before I inject noise, because if I inject noise, I, I've already made my problem a lot easier, in my opinion. OK, anyway, the bottom line here is you should do overparameterization, and you should use the penalty term. This is what the first slides are telling you. OK, now I want to go to what's done in, in deep learning. And in deep learning, they use for sigma. Remember the sigma. They don't use a linear space. They use a space of outputs of a neural network. I don't know how familiar the audience is with neural networks and what kind of functions are generated by a neural network. So I have to put in a few slides to try to give you some feeling for this, just in case you've never seen a neural network before and you're completely lost. That's what the next few slides are. They're trying to explain what neural networks are, what they look like, what are their properties. And uh, I want to do this in as palatable form as possible. So neural network is going to produce, given certain param given parameters, so it's a nonlinear family. It's a, a nonlinear manifold. You give it some parameters and it produces a function which depends on those parameters. How it does it, so the function it produces, you may think of as something like a polynomial or a spline or, I mean, it, it, it's a, that type of a function, except it depends on parameters. I'm going to explain what functions it, it produces next and tell you a little bit about them. Now, in, in the neural network jargon, there, there are actually a zillion neural networks because you can choose the architecture of the network. You can choose what they call the activation function, sigma of the network, and so on and so on. So you can get a bunch of different neural networks. I'm going to choose a, an activation function, which is called ReLU, rectifiable linear unit and it's just a, given a number y it's just a positive part of y i mean if y is positive it's just y if y is negative it's zero right so this is relu i'm going to use this activation you say oh you want some other fine use your other activation we can look at it also in reality this is the most used uh, activation function in, in applications. Now I want to tell you what the output of a neural network looks like. So here's, given, uh, given that you want to create a function, in this case, it's a function of two variables. So this x and y here, they would be the input. You put it through this neural network, you get the value of this function at these two, this pair of this x, y input, right? So the neural net is de described by a graph. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you how, how, how it proceeds. You input your vector x, y. To, it's a vector in R2. You apply a matrix to this vector. You add a, what we call a bias, which is a, a, another vector. And then you apply this ReLU. So basically, you're doing an affine transformation if you just did affine transformations, you would get sort of nowhere because you keep applying affine transformation to affine transformation, you just get an affine transformation. So this ReLU part, this 
nonlinear activation is utterly important because it's, it, it, it's doing something. But anyway, this is how you proceed. You input, you then apply this matrix to the input, add the bias, apply ReLU. That gives you the new vector at this first layer. Then you repeat this. Use this as the input, apply a matrix different than the first matrix. Each level, at each layer, the matrix is new and different. And you proceed on in this way. And then finally, from these, these are called neurons, you take a linear combination and that's your output. So that's how you create these functions. Your parameters are the entries in this matrix. You can choose them. It's wonderful, it's a free country. You can choose whatever you want for these parameters. The bias vectors, you can choose them, okay? What you, what you can't choose in this is this ReLU activation that's fixed. Okay, you do this and you get a whole bunch of functions. <clears throat> we measured the complexity by how many parameters did you use? How, you know, how many entries in the matrices in that? That will be our N that corresponds to like uh, dimension in the case of linear spaces. So this, as you vary the parameters, maybe I have this said somewhere, yeah. Whoops. I thought I had it somewhere written. Oh, here it is, alpha. You see the alpha down here? Alpha are your parameters. And as you vary the alpha to parameters, you get different functions. So if you look at the mapping of alpha to the function S alpha, this is a manifold of functions. Not linear, but nonlinear nonlinear because of this value. Okay. Well, that may help a little bit, but here's a little bit more information. I'll tell you what these functions look like. So you, you wonder, well, what are these functions, S alpha? You, you prescribe the parameters, you get a function. What are they? Well, here's what I can tell you. Some things I can tell you. That if you're looking at ReLU activation, every one of these functions that you create is a continuous piecewise linear function on some partition of Rn. What is Rn? That was your domain. You know, your functions are living on Rn. And my graphical example with N, capital N was two. Can be any. In the applications of deep learning, capital N is usually huge. I told you it's 10,000 or something, right? The number of pixels and images. Okay, so th this is a continuous piecewise linear function on a partition into convex polys. So holy cow. The number of cells in the partition can be huge. It's whatever the width is. Even if you say, okay, I'll take width two. The number of cells can be as large as W to the N, and remember, could be 10,000. L, this is the number of layers in your network. You see already, this is humongous, right? The number of cells is humongous. So you may say, wow, that's great, because I only use, let's say, 20 parameters, N, 20 parameters, and yet I get this huge number of cells and this very large partition. And the cells are anisotropic. They can be long and thin. They don't have to be uh, regular in any sense. So you might think I have a really powerful approximation tool. And this may be why these neural networks are so great. But there are a lot of uh, important things to say that minimize this effect. The first, the, the most important is if you look at the partition that you get, you put in parameters, you get a partition. And you look at the piecewise linear function on the partition. You are not allowed to choose the pieces in this piecewise linear function. They're determined by the parameters. 
So it's not the job, it's not like we're usually doing finite element methods or something where we first choose the partition and then we choose the piecewise linear subordinate to that partition. No, you're not allowed to do that. They're done in tandem. And you don't get all the CPL, WL functions, piecewise linear function, subordinate to the given partition. Far from it, you get very few because there are linear dependencies in the piece, the linear pieces across the different cells. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let me just do one hidden layer. Suppose you just had one hidden layer. What are what are these? What what are the outputs of these neural networks? So n is two dimensions. If I did larger dimensions, same picture holds. I just can't do it, right? I'm not so clever as to give you a seven dimensional picture. But in two dimensions, what you're doing is you're allowed to put down any little n hyperplane. Little n is the number of uh, parameters. You can put down little n hyperplanes, which in two dimension are just lines. Put down these lines, you get a partition into cells, right? Here are these cells. This is a typical, we call this a hyperplane arrangement. So a cell would be like this dark gray one, or it could be this uh, dotted uh, cell here. You see that they're anisotropic. You see that they're uh, also convex, polyhedra. This is what you get. If you look at one hidden layer, these are the kind of partitions you get. And as I said before, you get linear functions on each cell and the totality is continuous, but you don't get all linear functions, all piecewise linear functions. There's strong dependence that once you prescribe the partition, you're very limited as to the piecewise linear functions you get. Okay, so these, this is that. Uh, let me see. Okay, one, what happens when you go to deeper networks? The important property is composition. How am I doing time wise? 519? Yes, 519. Okay, minutes. I'll need about 10 more minutes. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> so, what happens when you go to deeper networks? The important fact is that the functions you output and when you have deeper network are just compositions of these one hidden layer guys. You just functional compositions. Well, this looks simple, at least analytic to, to describe what they are, but you can imagine what these functions look like is very complicated, right? You start doing composition. So composition is the, an important element in the outputs of these neural networks, the functions you get and that you will use for approximation. If I want to say more words about what these outputs look like, so this is the class of all outputs of a neural network with, with W, that is the number of uh, vertical nodes is W, and L is the number of layers that was these levels. Then if I look at that set of functions, the outputs are related in some ways to the following. First of all, to dynamical systems. You can prove theorems that outputs of dynamical systems lie in this space. <clears throat> they have certain tensor-like structures. This is important. Notice, for example, if you, if you take the composition of two guys and each has n parameters to it, the composition only involves two n parameters, not n squared parameters. If you had polynomials, for example, the polynomial of uh, degree n and another polynomial of degree n, you take their composition, you get a polynomial of degree n squared 
n squared. This is this is hurting us numerically to have so many parameters. The number of parameters blows up here. Composition, the number of parameters grows linearly. Okay, that's important. You can get fractal-like functions as outputs. The example is the sawtooth functions. So if you look at these, this right sawtooth function, this is a the output of a neural network with only three parameters or four, I mean, some very small. And as you, you let n go bigger and bigger, with 10 parameters, I can get a sawtooth function with two to the 10, two to the 10 teeth. So a lot of ups and downs, ups and downs, but I'm only using 10 parameters. So this is, tells you a little bit about the power of these. Okay, now what is this bias from the point of view of approximation? So we have these outputs and we wanna use them to, to approximate. We wanna use them in the end to do our learning, our learning algorithms. Well, learning algorithms are to create an F hat and the F hat is to approximate F. And we're gonna use these neural networks to create the F hat. So it's of interest to know how well do these neural networks do in approximation? Well, this is a big, big subject. Hundreds of papers written, and I'm gonna summarize it in two, two slides, two or three slides. First, the first thing to say is they do as well, if you just think in terms of approximation, how, how small they can make the error given the number of parameters little n, then the good news is they can do as well as any classical method. Polynomials, finite element methods, splines, uh, wavelets, whatever methods you have, uh, give me that method and I will, I think, prove that the neural networks when used with the same number of parameters will do will give whatever theorem you have in your context, I will get in this context. So all, for all classical smoothness classes, they do as well as any method, but in fact, they do better. These are called super convergence theorem. A, a simple example requires very little knowledge is that if F is a lip one function on zero one, you can use neural nets with n parameters and get accuracy n to the minus two. Now, if you haven't seen this before, and the first time I saw it, I said, there's some mistake. This isn't right. Because if we use any other kinds of things like finite element methods or splines or whatever, we get n to the minus one. And we, we sort of think, oh, that's the best you're gonna do is n to the minus one, but it's doing n to the minus two. So you think it's a mistake, but it's not. And I'm gonna explain it in a minute. Uh, but before doing that, I wanna say that it can approximate a wide variety of functions using n parameters. It can approximate the function to exponential accuracy, e to the minus n for lots of functions. Now, the functions it can do it for are, for example, analytic functions, that's not so surprising. Polynomial, that's not so surprising. But the Weierstrass function, which isn't even, is not even lip one, right? It's a very non-smooth function, but I can approximate it to accuracy e to the minus n using neural nets with n parameters. And the reason is it has self-similarity. And in general, there are theorems that if you have functions built on self-similarity, fractal-like functions, you do well in the approximation. All right, I wanna explain those results and maybe that they're not so surprising and they're not so great. <clears throat> and why, why is that the case? That is now, I've told you, so far that neural nets can do great at uh, approximation. Number of parameters, they give you a really good error. 
But now I want to say the negative. I want to say, well, well, wait a minute. It's not that great. And why it's not that great? Well, if you think about it, what are neural nets doing? You're given your, what, the, what they create as outputs, the functions that are used to do approximation, the outputs. We fix n the number of parameters. And then when you stick in the parameters, they give you the function s, right? s, this is the parameters, and these are the variables x, right? So this is a mapping from n parameters into the space of functions, right? So this is this nonlinear manifold. The outputs are a nonlinear manifold. Now this nonlinear manifold, this mapping is not too bad. Not too bad. It's actually Lipschitz on any finite ball, although the Lipschitz constant is humongous when the ball gets big. But what I want to stress is you're using this nonlinear manifold to do the approximation. And the way an approximation method looks like is given your function f, you have to choose <coughs> the parameters, which I'll call a and f, that are going to be used to do the approximation. It's like choosing the coefficients in a linear space if you were using linear spaces, right? <coughs> so this is a special example of what we call manifold approximation, using an n-dimensional manifold to do your approximation. And a manifold need not be linear, need not be a linear space, it can be a nonlinear manifold. <coughs> now, if I open the door to you and say, look, you can use any n-dimensional manifold you want, you'll say, wow, great. I can do fantastic. I can do with one dimensional manifold. I'll do everything. How? Well, you just take a space filling manifold, right? In one dimension, you can fill your set K that your function's coming from with one dimension to just, you know, move around in K all you want and fill up K and you can get arbitrary accuracy with one parameter. It's great, isn't it? I like it, I like to, to, to the analogy that you have a radio. The radio can receive every station in the world, right? Every radio station in the world. This is like, the radio is like my manifold. I can get any function I want, basically, by jiggling the parameters in this manifold. The problem is tuning the radio, turning the dot knob to get your station. <coughs> Given your target station, you'll never get it. You'll tune as soon as you move a little bit, you're jumping around so much in terms of the stations you're, you're, you're getting, you'll never get the station you want. This is part of what's happening with uh, in, in this. And in fact, oh, there's a wonderful theorem that I, I wanted to mention. Is Ralph in the audience? Maybe not. But this, this theorem was done when I was at South Carolina with Ralph Howard and Charlie Michelli. And it says that if in the using manifolds, if you require that this mapping and that selects the parameters is continuous. Now, all of a sudden, all this great approximation you can get. Remember in the case of neural networks, I claimed that there was this super n to the minus two error approximation for lip one. You can't get it with continuous selection. You have to use discontinuous. Disc continuous, very unstable selections in order to get this accuracy. I sometimes am pointing with my finger at home <laughs> at the screen rather than using the cursor. And of course you can't see, see my finger. All right, so this explains what, how deep, how neural networks 
are doing the super job at approximating. It's using this nonlinear manifold and instability in the selection of the parameters in the manifold. Now I want to return to my original problem of deep learning. I have two, two slides. Try to say what is going on in deep learning when they use neural networks and why does it work? Why does it perhaps not work? So here's to what, what a deep learning algorithm does. Remember we're given data and it wants to create this approximation to F from the data. First of all, it never makes an explicit model class assumption on the underlying function F, the target function we're trying to capture. This bothers me, right? How to, you can't prove anything if you don't assume anything about F. So what the hell are they doing? It uses very highly overparameterized neural network. In fact, everything is big. The ambient, I mean, the, the, the dimension, capital N, right? That is, they have functions of capital N variables and capital N is 10,000. The amount of data is huge. <clears throat> the number of parameters is bigger than the data. So it's also huge. <clears throat> and then it solves the least squares problem or tries to. Of course, this is a very complicated problem to solve where sigma is now the neural network that has been chosen. So sigma is the neural nets with n parameters, little n parameters. So it's trying to fit the data using these functions, depending on n parameters in this high dimensional space. But it doesn't use any penalty term, okay? One thing that bothers me from the beginning, it never looks at it that what it really needs to do is to find a good strategy for what PW perp of F should be. It's not trying to find PW perp. Remember in my discussion, this was the unknown to us. What is F in the orthogonal direction off of the data? I don't see clearly stated what it's doing to find what F looks like off of the data. Whoops. So given that that's what it's doing, what could be the reason for success? So I'm gonna throw out a few possibilities. Uh, I'm not super confident in any of these, but it's food for thought, maybe why. And of course, what we need is mathematicians to look at this problem more carefully. But here are some possible reasons. First of all, how do they evaluate success? Because they say, oh, we're doing great. How do they evaluate success? They evaluate success on what they call test data. So what did they do? They took all the data you gave them, divided it in, into two sets, the training data and what they call the test data. They reserve the test data. They use the training data to find their algorithm. And then when they want to judge how the, while the algorithm is performing, they look at the test data and see, did it do well on the test data? Well, this is not a mathematical certification of anything, right? This is only telling you that it, 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 it does well in some sense. Now, in what sense does it do well on the test data? They usually quantify this in terms of probability that it gave the right classification on the test data. And if they can get 92%, then they say they have a, a, a super good result. And in their favor is the fact that other algorithms can't do as well. Other algorithms are given the same scenario, data, test data, uh, training data, test data, do not do as well. But from a mathematical point of view, this is not certifiable, it means that is questionable when they say that they're successful. Another point is that there are no restrictions on computational time that I understand in this whole subject. And how long it took them to find this good neural network, the parameters in the good neural network. 
It may take them six months on Google computers to find it, five. Now in numerical analysis, this is a concern to us. In numerical analysis, we always look at algorithms and say how well they do by saying how much computation did I need to invest to get this accuracy. This is absent in this field as far as I can see. Why could they be doing well? It may be that the target functions that they're looking at actually sit in some model class. They don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but there may be a model class which is very restrictive that it's actually a small model class. And that is why the problem could be possibly solved. But they don't use model class assumptions, right? We went over that. But their argument is that they're using a, a version of gradient descent where they're restricting the step sizes both in the direction, not necessarily in the direction of uh, steepest descent, but possibly some other directions, and the length of the step. And they claim that this is somehow an implicit regularizer, but the theorems aren't there to whet this out as to actually what is the regularization. Okay, so I know I've gone over, I always go over. I apologize for that and I stop yeah. at this point. And Thank you very <laughs> much, Ron. It, it was a very nice talk. And uh, I, I don't think that you went too much over. That was actually the most interesting part at the end. So oh, I want the to- The other part was, <laughs> you could forget the other part. Huh? No, I knew the other part, so that's- uh, I'm joking. Uh, okay, uh, so- uh, so I, I want to ask for questions. Yeah, I'm sorry that I, you know, there was yep. not too much time in the talk to ask questions. Yeah. Please ask. No, you now. asked some questions, but uh, that's. Huh? Okay. Please ask them now. If somebody wants to add, uh, <laughs> you can unmute yourself. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. I don't uh, yeah. yourself. Yeah, I'm Levon. Nice to meet you. Thanks a lot for a very nice uh, talk. So uh, in the results that you mentioned about the super convergence, so uh, as far as I remember from the approximation theory, these types of results, you fix the basis, which is kind of equivalent to fixing the neural network structure. And then within that basis, you say, okay, uh, using n coefficients, right? Or n, n degree polynomial or whatever, I can find this error. So these results for super convergence, are they within a fixed structure of neural network or it just says there is a neural network with these many parameters that gives you this one over n squared approximation? Well, uh, okay, so the answer is that the, the network not only, so, so the, here's what you could say. You could say the architecture of the neural network is fixed, that is, in these results, you can prove that you can fix the width to be like 10, fix the depth to be n, whatever. Now, if you fix the depth to be n, the number of parameters will be a constant times n, right? Uh, you can check that the number of parameters is a constant times n. Now you can look inside this neural network and you can find an approximate to f with a advertised accuracy. What you cannot do is you can't find a linear space of dimension n such that inside that linear space, I mean that linear space living in your neural network, that in that linear space you can find the approximation to f. As you move f around, the approximants won't lie in a linear space. They're going to be in a this nonlinear manifold so that uh, for example when I define it describe it by partitioning uh, my partitions would be changing very greatly as I move around in fact in an unstable way because as I told you if you require the selection of parameters to be continuous you won't get this result n to the minus two you will only get n to the minus one so it's not quite the same as what we call n-term 
approximation, I think this is what you were referring to, where you take some nice little uh, dictionary or, or basis and to create the approximation, you take a sum of n terms from this uh, uh, basis, right? Is that, did that answer your question or not? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's sort of, it may be closest to what Volodya likes to call dictionary approximation, or what, what do you call it, Volodya, where you have a bunch yeah, of spaces and you can pick one of these n-dimensional spaces off the shelf to do the approximation. Oh, this will be nonlinear Kolmogorov weights. Yeah, but except that the this, yeah, this, this, is, this is, is not governed by your theory. It's not governed yeah, by yeah. your theory because it's unstable. And oh, the yes, number sure. of selections. This, this, this is different. But as you yeah, mentioned, it's, just these dictionaries. But again, if you make the dictionary really huge. Uh, then you can make this M term, I mean, one term approximation very well, very good. Yeah, that's, it, that's okay. analogous to my example of uh, curve. Analogous, yeah, to my, uh, uh, yeah. of uh, a one dimensional manifold filling the space. Yeah. So yeah. I think what you're doing is you're, you're putting in a lot of parameters, but you're entering instability in so finding this approximation and so I don't know whether it's a fair game because numerically you're going to run into a serious problem. Um, yeah. yeah. How, how, how sensitive is in general the approximation success with regard to the architecture? See, you, I, I think you have results where you show, oh, you can, you can get the same rates, say, with a fixed width and sufficient depth, as opposed to smaller depth and larger width. Because yeah. if, if, if this flexibility is not there, then you essentially have very little ch ch uh, chance to do, to prove anything rigorous, because that universe of possible parameter distributions in such high dimensions that you end up with over parameterization, so huge, I mean, the probability of hitting the right param uh, the, uh, architecture would then be very small, unless there is a large flexibility that essentially you can, whatever architecture you choose, you can, can essentially gain similar performance. Is, is, is that intuition correct or? Yes. So I'll answer it in, with three statements. The first statement is, the super convergence results were all proved with an architecture where the width is fixed. Okay, the width doesn't change. I see. And the depth changes, and the depth is n. Okay, the width will have to be large enough to accommodate the number of variables of the function. Basically, yeah. that's it. You know, whatever. So you, you you tend to start tracing a curve like stepwise in a way. What do you mean? Because it becomes, it becomes like a fixed stencil and then a dynamical system discretization where you evolve in time towards, towards a certain target. That's true that you, you, you yeah, that you. Is you that start, the intuition? Well, you're talking now about what the numerical algorithms do, but ju just in terms of your question. No, 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 even, even in the proof. I mean, in, in the construction of a, of, of a viable <clears throat> architecture that, that catches your object. But uh, the proofs are of the super convergence are rather uh, complicated, I would say. I mean, they, 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 they rely on a something called bit extraction, which can be done with neural nets very well. I don't know if I could interpret the no, bit no, extraction so. easily. But what I, I did want to say a couple more words on what uh, you, you were asking. And, and, and that is, so on the one hand, I can fix sort of the architecture, right? To a reasonable extent. Although people do use other architectures by saying, well, I'll use sparse connections between different levels and trying to reduce the number of parameters. But in the theorems that I mentioned on superconvergence, you use full connectivity between okay. these. 
uh, yeah. the different levels. Okay, what uh, now I'm losing track of what your question is. When, when you asked it, I had three things in mind to tell you. <laughs> well, well how, how accurately do you have to guess in architecture? Say to, in, in particular, in oh, higher dimensions, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in order to be successful in a good expressivity or in okay. good approximability. Yeah, so there was, here was a, another thing I wanted to tell you. I have a meta theorem, okay? My meta theorem is only proved in a limited case. And it is that if, if what I'm gonna allow in for the neural network is I'm always gonna use ReLU activation. You may disagree and say, no, I wanna use you know, tangents and this and that. But I'm gonna use ReLU activation and I'm gonna use cool connectivity. Then I wanna say to you, Depth always beats width. I see. So I want to say, if you if you say you're going to invest 500 parameters, and you could say, well, I'll build the neural net with one hidden layer and 500 parameters in width, or I'll build the neural net with two parameters uh, with 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 depth two, and asso associate my parameters okay. over these two levels, etc. That the best thing to do is to fix the width small and, and increase the depth. Okay, but here's now my question. Suppose your target function just happens to be a neural network of depth three with yeah. one layer very large, another layer somewhat smaller, very specific. Yeah. And you don't know it now. Right. So this, this eats n parameters. No, would, yeah. would, 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 you, would you remain in the proportionality of n parameters by adjusting the depth for fixed width to this guy? It, in, in, the, my, it in, in the cases where I have proved it, uh, what I have proved is that if you take a function that's in a neural net with, let's say, depth two yeah. and 100 parameters, I can find it in a neural net with width two <laughs> and then and 100 boom. parameters. I see. That's what I proved. Okay, good. Prove any guy there appears later. Well, well, that means that if you- But expand, I don't have it in all dimensions and in all settings, this theorem. I only have it in one dimension. I see. This is in the- Because that would be interesting right because that would mean you can expand successively and, 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 and sort of do a more a better monitored approximation than throwing all your parameters in one bucket and then hope the best your stochastic gradient descent does anything reasonable. Right. I would say that there should be an adaptive procedure. And maybe this is what ResNets and all this, I, I don't quite yeah. ha have the analytical. Um, I haven't looked at them analytically enough, but it seems to me that there should be a procedure where you use a first hidden layer, find an initial approximation path, look at the and residual. And then expand. And then go yeah. down. Now, what seems to happen though, is that they come back and make corrections. Just like, you know, the old stuff we did with adaptive algorithms. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you that's like- You doing it, Peter, like knows this very well. You start, like you start making your yeah. adapt, adaptive choice and you yeah, find yeah. out, oh, Jesus, I've done the wrong thing. I put it in the wrong, place, I should go back and make a correction. Right. You have this wonderful paper in, 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 and I right. on how you can avoid this by putting in, what do we call it, penalty or? Penalty, yes. Yeah, we put in a penalty. That is, if you make wrong decisions a few times, we, we say, you have to pay money for this and don't do it again. <laughs> you know, go stop making that decision. It's a stupid decision yeah. to make. Uh, so anyway, there has yeah. to be such a theory for neural nets, I think, that says, okay, take the initial guy, do it adaptively, you know, pick pick the first layer right. the best you can. And now you look at the residual, try to do the second layer, et cetera, but with, with some possibility of noticing you're doing something wrong and making corrections. I don't know what it is. I'm just giving vague thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Some other questions? Uh, yes, quick, uh, very quick question. Yeah. 
Yeah, everything that I've seen so far is, first of all, uh, a great talk. And everything I've seen so far is only working for fully connected neural network. But in general, at, at least in people in industry are not using, and very rarely using fully connected neural network. Is there any theorem it, it, proven by convolutional neural network or any other network that are used in industry? Because it seems very difficult to get like a convolutional neural network, max pooling and all this trick into a mathematical framework, into a very rigorous mathematical framework setting. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, you know, my, I don't know too much about exactly what's used in practice, except that I think the, the fact that they're typically solving classification problems and these revolve around images and you have a long buildup in, in uh, uh, image processing and double E and all that, which in which convolution pooling and all those kind of filters, filter design, all this had a role. They injected them into the neural net business and they visualize what these neural nets are doing from this framework. I mean, I, I mean, I talked to the double E people and it's like a different world, the way they view neural nets and, 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 and what the neural net is doing and, and choosing these. So the approximation community, us guys, we, you know, we're interested in proving a theorem. So we try to put ourselves in the most convenient setting for proving a theorem. And so the bottom line or the answer to your question is we always put ourselves in this favorable place case and it doesn't include convol convolution networks. It doesn't include ResNets. It doesn't include pooling. And it does, you know, lots of stuff that is done are not employed by us. We, we, we tend to put ourselves in the following setting where we, we take uh, ReLU and we have full connectivity or we have some very restricted sparse connectivity. That is, we, we really see what's going on with the sparse connectivity. We're not going crazy where you have very few connections and a lot of connections and very few, you know, and you're not bouncing around. They're organized in a very specific way. But our goals are different, you know. I don't know if that answered your question. But... Yeah, yes, it did answer my question. But, uh, I have some experience training from neural network, and something I noticed that when you are running like stochastic gradient descent and you compare with what all the people in the industry are using, like Adam and all these like gradient methods, you get yeah. better result. But did you try to follow the core for, of the Adam or all these other gradient methods? It's very difficult to try to make it mathematically rigorous. That's, that's a good point. I mean, I think that's what's bothering us. You know, they're using these deep learning algorithms and you don't have a certifiable uh, performance. And they're using them in some areas where you may question a little bit whether they should be used, but they're, they're using them. And we would like a mathematical statement that we guarantee that it does what you want to do, at least with some probability or this and that. And yet the way they're implemented are so complicated. Uh, we don't understand what the hell they're doing. What is this black box doing? I think this is what you're pointing out that all my theory is fine and dandy, but if you really look at what they're doing, they're tweaking this, tweaking that, and you can't see exactly what they're doing. We had the same thing with image processing. For example, in image compression, people came up with you know, the idea of wavelets, thresholding wavelets, this is the way to do it. But in practice, when they do JPEG or something, they, they tweak it this way and that way. And you'll never, I mean, even though it has this general principle behind it, wavelet, I think, filter design principle, uh, you won't find it if you look at their algorithms. I mean, it's just too complicated. Okay. Uh, Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any, Other questions? Or... If there is time, I uh, can ask one more question. Uh, sure. L last you question. Have okay. Peter, we ask to pay, pay Peter twenty dollars because he's got too many questions. Oh, come on. <laughs> so. Uh, so. Uh, it, it seems that 
uh, uh, like this space, for instance, spaces like C1, C2, and CK spaces are kind of, um, or like Hilbert spaces are kind of like well adapted for this classical approximation theory, like a linear approximation theory. Uh, what are your thoughts about like, um, you know, what would be good spaces for, you know, approximation theory using like neural uh, networks? So are the usual spaces good or maybe, you know, one has to look at kind of like different things that have to take into account this composition structure or whatever? Well, it's a question of whether you're talking about, so there are two, two, two ways spaces enter in. One is measuring error. And what uh -huh. they usually use for measuring error is they use L2 norm or, uh, but in measuring error, the important thing will be the probability measure underlying. Why? Because you're in high dimensions. I mean, if you're, uh -huh. you're in high dimensions, uh, you know, one, one point has very little significance in high dimensions. If you, if you're in 10,000 dimensions and you just want to have point space one half apart, Right, uh -huh. maybe two to the ten thousand or more. I mean, on a on a finite cube, you you'll need a humongous number of points. You'll never you'll never have such points. So what what must be happening is that when you know the function at one point, it it really severely limits the function in some way from from just moving a little bit as you move away from that point because if if we were allowed to move you would never be able to capture it because of the high dimension so what is really happening also when you sample i mean no matter how many samples you have you're not going to have two to the ten thousand samples right so why should these few samples determine the function why i mean it's a, if you're in ten thousand dimensional space why should you know 10 million samples in any way determine the function, no way. Unless you have the underlying probability measure is somehow very sparse and regular. I don't know what the exact condition is. Okay, so that's on the side of measuring error. Now you have the model class side. Now the model class side, I agree, I agree with you. The, the secret in the model class is what are reasonable model classes that employ composition? That is, when you compose functions, they have a, a, a they don't depend on many parameters, let's say, but they can be very complicated. And we can't describe them in terms of ordinary notions of smoothness. We have to have new notions. What are these? I think this is something that uh -huh. Wolfgang is very interested in trying to understand. What, what are these composition of functions? What the hell do they look like? What does it really give you? I, I don't know the answer. I mean, we, we have some ideas that give you fractal-like, uh, you know, uh, self-similarity, dynamical system, different things, tensor structures. Yeah, we know a little bit, but we really don't know fully what's going on there by any means makes it an exciting uh, world from that point of view. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank okay. you very much. So Ron, thank you very much for wonderful lecture and very good uh, questions, so. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.